find our speaker. <laughs> Flint, come on in. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Flint join us today, and he has been a speaker with us before. And for those of you who not, may not be aware of him, he has his own website. Uh, he's an award-winning author and military historian and a former U.S. Army officer who served on active duty from 1965 to 70, including a tour in Vietnam. Uh, he's a noted author. His books include Soldiers on Skis, the 10th Mountain Division, The Rock of Anzio, and The Fighting First, among others. In addition, as if he has nothing else to do, he's editor-in-chief of Military History Quarterly. Uh, oh, military, oh, yes, excuse me. Yeah, a, and a regular contributor to World War II and World War II history magazines. And he's president of the newly formed Colorado Military History Museum. No, no, that's old. Oh, well, this came from your website. <laughs> we got, oh, 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 anyway. So anyway, without, without further ado that I've muddied it enough with the introduction, uh, Flint, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. It was green. Technology, you know. Why are you yeah, thank you. Okay. We have gone entire shows, had a great recording and no sound. <laughs> so. so hopefully you have lip readers who yeah. can interpret that. Yes. Good, good. Thank you, Mike, very much. Uh, and welcome to all of you coming out on a cold, uh, rainy, gloomy day. You got nothing better to do than to come out to the Broomfield Veterans Memorial Museum. And uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. Uh, on, uh, I just wanted to start on this particular slide. You'll notice that the two eyes in my name uh, are a little droopy. <laughs> I took this picture the other day, but they, they, they corrected that. So when you go out today, you'll see that the, the eyes are in their proper place. You'll also notice that uh, the title of my talk, I guess I couldn't get all the words in, is 45th Division Salerno Dachau, but the actual title is on the handout that we have here, the 157th Infantry Regiment Tracing the Legacy of Colorado's Forgotten Heroes. Now, how many of you uh, have any familiarity with the 157th Regiment? Can I see hands? Okay, good, because you're all, <laughs> all in the same boat now. And hopefully uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, we will give you uh, information and you'll be able to say, I know who those guys were. Let's talk a little bit about who came before the 157th Regiment. Uh, and it goes way back to the beginning of Colorado as a territory in the late 1850s and early 1860s. There were two militia groups in Denver at that time known as the Jefferson Rangers and the Denver Guards, but they were a very uh, slack outfit, I guess you could call them. Uh, they weren't uh, all that good. They, they kept the peace uh, in the territory and in Denver uh, early on, but um, it was decided that something more was needed with the uh, beginning of the Civil War. And so uh, President Lincoln appointed this man, William Gilpin, you've heard of Gilpin County, this is where the name comes from. Uh, William Gilpin is the first territorial governor, and uh, he was uh, very concerned, Lincoln was, that the United States was about to be split, that the Confederate uh, states had, had formed and they were seceding from the Union, and because of the gold and silver deposits that uh, Colorado had, it was very important to keep the territory within the Union and not let it be taken over by Confederates. And so Gilpin was charged with forming a uh, militia that would guard the entire territory and repel any invaders from, uh, from the South. And so he formed what was called the First Regiment of Colorado Volunteers. Uh, you probably have heard about the Battle of Glorieta Pass in northern New Mexico. Well, it was the first regiment of Colorado volunteers who fought against the Texans who had 
uh, moved up through the Rio Grande Valley, through New Mexico, and were on their way to Colorado to take over the gold and silver mines. Because of this battle, the Texans were defeated and sent back to Texas. And it wasn't until the 1960s when Texans started moving here in droves and, and uh, eventually uh, accomplished their, their long-held goal. Uh, you may have also heard of the Sand Creek Massacre. The uh, officer in charge of that was uh, Colonel Shivington. Uh, Shivington had been a key figure in the defeat of the Texans at Glorietta Pass, and he was labeled the hero of Glorietta because of what he had accomplished there. But after uh, the, the battle had been won, he and uh, some of the other officers returned to Colorado, and because of Shivington's popularity, he was made the head officer of the Colorado uh, militias. And uh, it was Governor Evans who sent him out on this raiding party to um, do what he did at uh, Sand Creek. So he quickly went from um, the hero of Glorietta to the butcher of Sand Creek and uh, has forever stained uh, his name um, with, with his, his deeds. The 157th was formed in the late 1800s here in Colorado. And um, it was, it took part in the Spanish-American War. There were two fronts, one in Cuba, one in the Philippines. And the 157th was sent to the, to the Philippines and it uh, took part in the siege and capture of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Remained there for a few months uh, in occupation duty and then returned to the States. Uh, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there were a series of uh, labor wars, I guess you could call it, where strikers at the, at the coal mines in southern Colorado and elsewhere uh, throughout the state uh, were going on strike and uh, it became a, a pretty violent affair and the governor of Colorado was forced to call out uh, the National Guard uh, as they were uh, then known. Uh, to put down the strikes and uh, there were uh, some bloody clashes that uh, resulted in that. About this time too, uh, the state started building armories around uh, the, the, uh, the state in various communities. Uh, Camp George West in Golden uh, was begun in 1903. The Fort Collins Armory went up in 1907. Uh, in Fort Morgan, they had an armory uh, that was built in 1910 and in Jefferson County in Golden in 1913, that armory was built. On the CU campus, there was an armory built. Greeley had one that came online in 22 and the Denver armory was, uh, I don't know if you remember, located where the Channel 9 headquarters and studios are located now on Spear Boulevard. Uh, I wasn't able to find the date on that, but it was probably the early uh, 1920s. This was, this was because it was being recognized that our state needed to have military preparedness uh, for you know, natural disasters or labor strikes or even a world war. Well, along comes uh, the First World War. The U.S. goes to war in 1917, and here we see some of the Colorado troops getting ready to board the train at uh, Union Station in downtown Denver to head off uh, for their uh, involvement. The 157th was at that time assigned to the 40th Division, which was basically a replacement division that sent out troops uh, to other units when they suffered casualties. And the Colorado troops participated in, in these four uh, campaigns, which are very well known uh, in World War I. 1918, after the armistice was signed, the, uh, Denver, the Colorado troops came back to uh, our state. And uh, here's a shot of the victory parade through downtown Denver at that time. Uh, and then the Depression hit in the late 1920s and throughout the 30s. And uh, we sometimes think of those as the, 
Dust Bowl days, really difficult times economically and socially for our country. Um, Colorado being uh, mostly an agricultural state at that time, uh, had a lot of uh, young men and, and their families working on the Eastern Plains uh, at farming. And it was a very difficult time. And, and the young men who grew up during that period of time had a, uh, I guess you could say, a, an education in how to survive uh, during very difficult uh, times. They became very, very hardened and very tough individuals. Uh, many of them, in order to supplement their families' incomes, uh, decided to join the Colorado National Guard, the 157th Regiment. Uh, here we see a young man waving farewell uh, on his way to camp. Uh, and uh, the Guard was, um, was formed. They still had a lot of the World War I equipment left over. The National Guard always seemed to get the hand-me-downs from the regular army. Uh, here they were training uh, after they were federalized, meaning they were no longer just part-time weekend soldiers, but they were actually now brought onto active duty. And you, yeah, you can see here the, the sign that says 60 millimeter mortar um, because they didn't even have the right kinds of equipment. Uh, there were in, in training exercises, I've seen some films where they show a, a truck with a sign painted on the side that says tank. And, and, and guys are throwing grenades made out of flower bags at the, uh, at the tank. So uh, their, their training was very rudimentary and almost a joke. But they had to, to become uh, highly qualified and professional soldiers in a, in a great hurry. Now you look at this and you think, hmm, Nazis. But this was the insignia of the 45th Division at that time. It was because the 45th Division was comprised of the 157th from Colorado and two regiments from Oklahoma, the 179th and the 180th, and they had about three to 4,000 Native Americans in their ranks. They used this sun symbol that's um, a symbol of good luck uh, among Native American tribes as their, their symbol. But as Nazi Germany uh, began to uh, take on a greater focus, the troops <laughs> Uh, decided that probably wouldn't be the best shoulder patch to be wearing if they went into combat against the, uh, the Germans. And so they adopted the Thunderbird, which is also a, a Native American symbol that uh, enabled them to have their special geographic identity. Uh, here's a, a shot of Company D out of Montrose of the 157th. Um, young men are Oh, very happy about that, uh, being in that unit. Uh, and to, to look at the overall picture, in World War II, eventually after it was fully formed, there were 91 combat divisions in the uh, European theater of operations and in the Mediterranean theater, there were 52 of these combat divisions, which would be infantry and armor and airborne. In the Pacific, there would be 39 divisions. The National Guard, out of this 91 uh, comprised 18 divisions. The 157th was formed uh, with all of these companies um, and the slide shows you the uh, places where they were headquartered. I think the closest one to us here in Broomfield was Company G in, in Longmont um, and there was Company F in Boulder, so we had a, a couple of these uh, units that were uh, right here in uh, the neighborhood. There's a organization chart showing the three regiments, uh, how they were broken down in various uh, um, supplementary uh, auxiliary and attached units that were a part of the division. Overall, they had uh, almost 15,000 men in the division. Here we see some of the Native Americans in their Native American uh, uh, dress. A uh, very proud group of, of individuals and very skilled at, uh, at warfare. Um, this is one of the uh, sergeants, um, uh, uh, Sergeant Chilton, uh, who 
uh, was uh, an awardee of the Medal of Honor. And uh, there were uh, several of the, of the uh, soldiers who earned the Medal of Honor during the war. On December 7, 1941, when Japan attacked the United States and we went to war, um, we were fighting not only the Japanese, but also the Germans eventually. It took a while for us to get troops uh, into the um, North African and Mediterranean and European theater of operations. And meanwhile, down at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the uh, unit uh, continued to sharpen their war fighting skills. And uh, in June of 43, they got the orders to proceed overseas to a place called Sicily. Here's a shot of uh, the 45th Division in one of the troop ships. I think the bunks are stacked about five high. <laughs> Not the most pleasant of living experiences. And, and the, the journey took about 10 days, 12 days to, to get over there. And I think most of the men were seasick most of the, of the voyage. Uh, they got to Sicily in time for Operation Husky. Uh, Sicily, if I can, oops, oh no. There you go. Yeah. Doo -doo -doo. At least I didn't go all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So Sicily is right off the toe of the peninsula of Italy. And uh, here you get a better idea of the a geography of the island. It's mostly mountainous and a very difficult uh, country in which to fight. We had, the U.S. and the British had pushed the Germans and Italians out of North Africa uh, and the enemy had retreated to Sicily and um, we followed uh, there in, uh, in July of 43. Uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower was the overall commander. We think of Eisenhower only in terms of the Normandy invasion, but he actually was in charge of the Sicily operation, which was his first large-scale amphibious uh, operation uh, of which he had overall command. Uh, beneath him with the 8th Army uh, from Britain was uh, General Montgomery, and uh, commanding the 7th Army was General Patton. If you've seen the movie Patton, they spent a lot of time talking about uh, what, was, what was going on in Sicily at that time. Uh, you can see here that uh, the Americans landed on this part of the island. The British came in over on the, uh, the eastern side of the, of the island. And the idea was they were going to drive the enemy northward and cut them off at the pass here at Messina and uh, destroy them before they could uh, evacuate to the mainland, but it didn't quite work out that way. So Operation Husky begins on July 9th, 1943. Uh, as with most military operations, something bad goes, goes on and uh, a number of the uh, American 82nd Airborne Division planes are shot down by U.S. Navy gunners because they uh, couldn't identify the difference between German planes and uh, American planes. So took a lot of friendly fire casualties uh, during the operation. Here you can see the uh, rather jumbled and disorganized uh, scene on one of the landing beaches. A uh, storm had come up just about the time the landing was taken, taking place, and so things were a bit messed up. Hey, Dave. Uh, I mean, Lou. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, here's a group of 45th Division soldiers going through the Sicilian town of Cal uh, Tanisetta. Uh, some more Americans going through uh, the Sicilian towns. The orange uh, arrow points uh, the direction that the 45th Division um, had to take on the way to the northern shore of the island. Uh, and you can see the 3rd and the 1st Infantry Divisions um, paralleling them on either side and the British Army on the uh, far eastern side of the island, all moving towards the north and uh, pushing the, uh, the Germans ahead of them. This interesting uh, bit of military transportation here, a mule cart. 
but you know, got to use what you got to use. And many of the Sicilians were very happy to see the Americans arrive. Uh, they were not uh, pleased to be under German domination at that point. Um, and finally, the island um, is secured. A great number of the Italian and German forces are able to escape across the Strait of Messina and get to the mainland of, of the Italian peninsula where they live to fight another day. Uh, at this point, the Fifth Army was being formed and uh, Lieutenant General Mark Clark was uh, placed uh, in charge of that. And uh, at this point also, Troy Middleton was the commanding general of the 45th. And they are slated to go into the invasion at Salerno. And here we see the, uh, the invasion taking place. Here's Salerno, the 45th. Uh, is one of these, oh no, that's Tunisia, who, who come in from Sicily. There are other forces that come from North Africa. Uh, British forces land uh, at the toe of the peninsula and also in the uh, arch there. And then the idea was that they were going to move in concert uh, to the north. Uh, there's a map showing the invasion at Salerno and the 45th uh, is in the red circle here. And they're going to land here in the southern end of, of the beach. Uh, here we see some of the, uh, the uh, ships and vehicles coming ashore. It was a combined American and British operation because within the 5th Army there were both American and British divisions. Uh, here you see it looks pretty much like the Sicilian invasion. Uh, it was very difficult fighting. The Germans were ready for them. The 45th was the floating reserve and they were called in when the 36th Division uh, ran into problems uh, as soon as they hit the shore. And the Germans began throwing all of their weight against the 45th Division that had just come ashore. Uh, Field Marshal Kesselring was the head of the German forces in this part of Italy and he threw everything he had hoping to dislodge the, uh, the beachhead and throw the invaders back into the sea. But uh, we see the 45th coming ashore here against heavy fire. And despite several counterattacks that the Germans threw against them, they managed to prevent the Germans from splitting the, the beachhead and uh, stopping the invasion at the water's edge. Uh, the Germans had uh, a lot of very skilled troops uh, who had a lot of uh, good equipment that they threw against uh, the Americans, but eventually, uh, after taking a lot of casualties, the 45th moved into the Greek uh, temple area at Paestum. Anybody here ever been to Paestum? We have one, okay, and you. Um, and um, fortunately, there was no heavy fighting within the, the Greek ruins there and saved them from further destruction, but as they moved further inland, the 45th uh, ran into all sorts of uh, snipers' nests and booby traps and counterattacks, things of that sort that Kesselring was trying to uh, throw against them. Uh, they get a few miles north of the beachhead, which is here, to a town called Persano, where there was this large tobacco factory this is what uh, the ruins look like today. And there was a, a very fierce fight that, that took place at the tobacco factory. And the, uh, again, the 45th Division was able to, to hold its ground and prevent the Germans from pushing them back, uh, despite all of the panzers and, and aircraft and everything that uh, the Germans threw against them. Uh, fighting continued throughout the, uh, the autumn into the, into the hills and the mountains of the Apennines. Uh, moving northward, here's the town of what's left of San Pietro, if any of you have ever seen the, the film um, John Huston did for the army called The Battle of San Pietro. They talk about um, what, had, what had gone on here and how difficult it was. You can see the mountains behind uh, the town here, how steep they were, and, and the fighting was taking place throughout that area. Um, in this slide, Here's Salerno, here's the 5th Army moving up. Here's the 8th Army, the British, moving up. Uh, the, the Germans had created a series of defensive lines across 
the width of Italy. Uh, the Gustav Line was anchored at the town of Cassino. You, you may have heard of the, of the famous uh, uh, Benedictine Abbey there called uh, Monte Cassino. Uh, and again, it was all uphill fighting, very difficult. This is what the Abbey looked like. Well, this is the restored version because this is what happened to it during the fighting. It was pretty much uh, obliterated. Um, the 45th was about 10 miles southeast of, of uh, Casino at a town called Venafro. And um, they were being continually shelled and um, they had to go through the, the winter 1943 and um, endure some very severe conditions there. Uh, again, a lot of casualties were, were, ta were experienced. Um, and on num November 21st, uh, General Middleton was replaced by General William Eagles. Interesting, an eagle commanding a Thunderbird. <laughs> uh, Eagles had been the assistant division commander of the 3rd Infantry Division, and he was a very experienced uh, soldier and uh, was uh, placed in charge of the 45th at that time. Um, about this time when, when the Allies had come up against the Gustav Line, which was a very well defended defensive position, uh, all these attacks trying to get through it failed and, and failed miserably. There were, I think, four or five attacks against Monte Cassino itself that, except for the last one many months later, uh, all failed. And uh, Mark Clark decided, you know, maybe what we ought to do instead of just butting our heads up against this fortified line, let's do an end run. We've got the whole coast that we can utilize. And so uh, he proposed uh, a plan uh, to go around the German defenses. Uh, the Gustav line is represented there in red. And he said, why don't we take a core and uh, go from Naples uh, to Anzio, which is only like 35 miles from Rome, and uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll scare the Germans so much that they'll abandon the Gustav line because they wouldn't want to have our troops behind them, and then they're in a, in, in a, caught in a pincer. And so Churchill thought that was a really good idea, and he kind of became the driving force of the whole uh, Anzio operation, uh, along with uh, General... Uh, uh, Alexander, who was head of 15th Army Group, he was a British officer and uh, Clark's uh, immediate superior. Uh, so the operation, which was called Operation Shingle, was launched on January 22nd of 1944. And there was probably no large-scale military operation in history that had as much surprise value, except maybe for Pearl Harbor, as uh, Operation Shingle. The Germans were caught completely unawares by uh, the Sixth Corps, headed by General John Lucas. Here we see an aerial view of the Anzio area. There's basically twin towns. We've got Anzio here and Natuno here. This was the area where the Americans came on shore and also in the Anzio Harbor. There was a British division that landed about five miles up the coast and uh, at the same time. And, Everybody was astonished at, at how easy the invasion was. There was hardly any uh, defensive uh, fire coming from the shore. Here's the third division coming ashore, you know, just like a practice run. Um, but we still have our old nemesis, Albert Kesselring, who was probably one of the best commanders the Germans had in the war. And uh, when he saw what was going on, he immediately was able to bring in German troops from other parts of Italy and even France and Yugoslavia to seal off the beachhead without denuding his uh, front along the Gustav line. So uh, we have the Germans pouring in. Uh, I have a floating in there, should say Eberhard von Mackensen, uh, who was in, in uh, command of the 14th Army, uh, which was basically northern uh, Italy, and Mackensen was uh, given the responsibility of throwing the uh, invasion back. Uh, so we see some German troops moving up with a lot of tanks. Uh, at Venafro, the 45th Division is still waiting there, but then they get orders. We want you 
to be involved in the uh, shingle operation. So we see the chaplain of the 45th here before the, the men marched down or were driven down to Naples and boarded ships and landed at Anzio Harbor and were immediately thrown into the fighting. Uh, the fighting was, was very severe. Here we see the 157th, the 179th, and the 180th of the 45th Division along the only highway that runs from Anzio, which is down here, about 10 miles south, uh, and Rome. Uh, they were in the thick of the fighting and the Germans continued to throw uh, counterattack after counterattack at them. Uh, a lot of the fighting swirled around this uh, little town of Aprilia. Uh, the Germans brought in their heavy railroad guns and bombarded uh, the Thunderbirds uh, all hours of the day and night. Uh, the Americans fought back as, as best they could against panzers across open field and uh, uh, German troops continued to pour into the area. The weather also played a, a great uh, role in the situation and the conditions that the troops had to endure uh, there in Anzio. You, you could dig down about six inches to get a foxhole and suddenly it was filling with water and now you're lying in this mud water filled foxhole for days, weeks at a time uh, being shelled and uh, attacked. Did they take the mules over there? No, they, they got Italian mules when they were there. Uh, Bill Malden, if you're familiar with uh, Bill Malden, he was a cartoonist most famously for the Stars and Stripes uh, newspaper, but he was also a member of the 45th Division. He was with one of the Oklahoma regiments, and uh, this cartoon that he drew kind of sums up uh, the situation there. The, the caption says, Joe, yesterday you saved my life and I swore I'd pay you back. Here's my last pair of dry socks. <laughs> And that, that basically, you know, sums up, uh, with their feet underwater. and their feet are underwater, right, you know, dry socks were not going to do any good whatsoever. Uh, meanwhile, Churchill back in England is getting all these reports that the invasion has stalled, uh, they're not going anywhere, chances are good that they're going to be wiped out, and so there are two stalemates in Italy now. You've got one along the uh, Gustav line and you've got one. At, at Anzio, and uh, Churchill was furious. His famous line was, I thought we were hurling a wildcat onto the beaches and all we got was a stranded whale. <laughs> so that, that kind of summed up the situation. Uh, the troops continued to hold off uh, the Germans as much as possible. The Germans had the disadvantage that there was no uh, flanking maneuver. They had to do, everything had to be a frontal assault. And so every time they would mount an assault, they would be cut to pieces uh, and um, suffer tremendous casualties. Now, here, here's a gentleman who, who becomes very well known, Felix Sparks. Uh, he was a captain uh, in the 157th. At this time, he was captain of Company E. And uh, he is on the front lines. He's got panzers coming at him. He's got shells dropping in. Uh, and He's ordered to pull his men back from the front lines and go to a series of large caves uh, near Aprilia. And this is a contemporary photo I took a few years ago. You can just barely see the cave openings. Um, they started to excavate that area, but this was uh, where, where his uh, company held out. They, they got into the caves. They called fire down upon their, their own positions. Um, the Battle of the Caves was a very difficult time because the men were basically trapped there. And Sparks and one other enlisted man were able to get out of the caves. The rest of his men were either killed or captured. And he fell back uh, to friendly lines. Uh, this is another area that became very contentious. It was called the Overpass. Uh, and the Germans, this is the main highway uh, right down here that goes to Rome. This is a railroad track that goes to Rome. And the Germans had to pass through this narrow opening to get to the beachhead. And the, the 45th Division is in the 157th and the, some of the other British units are aligned right here in front of it. And the Germans keep throwing everything they have at, uh, at the Americans and British trying to break through. But all of their uh, attacks ended in, in uh, 
disaster for them. They were not able to, to get through the overpass that you see here. That was pretty much a battered shell by the time uh, the, the fight had died down. Uh, the German armor was knocked out. Uh, the battlefield was strewn with uh, dead bodies. And meanwhile, Lucas, 6th Corps commander, He's really uh, on, gotten on the bad side of Churchill and Alexander and um, to a certain extent Clark. And they're demanding that, that he be replaced with somebody else. And so Lucian Truscott, who was the commander of the 3rd Infantry Division, is put in charge of the 6th uh, Corps. And, and Lucas was a very cautious general. Uh, Truscott was a very aggressive, hard-charging general. And it was just what the, the Allies needed at, at this particular point. And Mark Clark uh, said, you know, once we get this front stabilized, then we're going to uh, break out of here and at the Gustav line as well. Uh, so from basically January, February of 44 until uh, the end of May of 45, uh, we have basically a stalemate. And so along the Gustav line over here, uh, at the end of May, the Americans and British along the line here start their massive attack to break through the line, which would be the signal for the guys at Anzio to break out as well. It's, it's a, a tremendous uh, battle that's fought th across the Mussolini Canal, which had been um, created early on. Many uh, Germans chose to uh, give up. Um, the attack went on for days until finally on June 4th, the Americans reach uh, Rome. And, and Clark didn't want the British to have any part of the liberation of Rome, so he made sure that it was only Americans who got to Rome first. And here you can see a welcome uh, at the Colosseum by the Romans uh, cheering the Americans on. Two days later, the invasion at uh, Normandy takes place. So we, commonly called the D-Day invasion. And so Italy is now, after a year of fighting, wiped off of the front pages of, of the world's news uh, papers. And uh, it, it kind of becomes the forgotten front. Uh, in August, another operation is mounted called Operation Dragoon, the invasion of southern uh, France. Hey, there it is. And the 7th Army, including the 45th Division, is brought in um, to southern France. This is the Normandy invasion here. Uh, the 45th disembarks there. They begin uh, the drive northward, uh, fighting their way through towns and villages and getting a hero's reception as they go, and also losing a lot of men in the process. Uh, they come up against the defenses of the Maginot Line that the Germans had taken over on the border between France and uh, Germany. Uh, they have to fight their way through little towns and villages like this uh, to get into Germany, which they eventually do in the spring of 1945. Here's a, a, a little old lady looking at the ruins of her home in a German city. Uh, the 45th fought in Aschaffenburg and liberated that town after a very difficult uh, bit of combat. They got into Nuremberg. April 17th. Uh, some of you have seen the newsreels of the big Nazi party rally stadium at Nuremberg and the big uh, swastika in uh, concrete up here. And you may have seen the, the, the swastika being blown up. That was the 45th engineers who, who did the blowing up. And then after Nuremberg, they headed south towards Munich. But in the way was a town called Dachau. Now, none of the American units were ever informed that they might encounter concentration camps once they, they got into the occupied territory. So Dachau meant really nothing to them. Uh, they didn't know about the concentration camp that was there. Uh, this is where the prisoner enclosure is. It, it became and is still a big tourist uh, attraction uh, for people looking uh, you know, for World War II sites. How many people here have been to Dachau? Okay, so you know, you know what, what it looks like at, at that point. The rest of this 
area is all uh, SS headquarters uh, area and uh, uh, the, the concentration camp provided slave laborers to some of the factories that uh, were located in, in the uh, um, rest of the compound. Uh, we've got the, the troops moving through Dachau and they come across a set of railroad tracks here on the 29th of April. They get a little closer and they find about, I think it's 39 railroad cars filled with corpses. There were like 2,300 dead men and boys in these railroad cars. Uh, they had been three weeks earlier evacuated from Buchenwald uh, to keep the Americans from finding out the extent of the Nazi atrocities. And they'd been on this kind of continual road, uh, railroad trip with no food, no water, uh, no, nothing for them. Uh, and so when the 45th and the, it's actually the, the third battalion of the 157th of which Felix Sparks is now the commander. Uh, his unit gets to Dachau. This is the railroad uh, line that goes into the camp. Um, they get into the camp. They discover things such as the crematorium there piled with bodies and they're just becoming enraged at, at what they're finding. Uh, and they start rounding up uh, any of the SS guards who had the misfortune of not leaving earlier. Uh, they took them into the coal yard at Dachau and lined them up. And uh, this machine gunner right here, um, he later claimed that he saw, it looked like the, the, the Germans were going to try and, and uh, rush the Americans, so he opened fire on them. And uh, Sparks, who was not right on the scene at that time, shows up, this is him with his uh, pistol drawn, and he's telling the men to cease fire. And we see back here uh, some of the uh, SS troops uh, getting hit, um, a shot of them uh, by the wall. I think there were something like 15 or 17 uh, SS soldiers who were killed in that. In the meantime, while this is going on, another unit is showing up at Dachau in the 42nd Division. And um, this, uh, it was an advance party led by the Assistant Division Commander, Brigadier General Henning Linden. Uh, they're called the Rainbow Division, that's their, their patch. And uh, Linden and his small group, he had maybe 10, 12 people, get to the main gate. Uh, Sparks and, and his unit go through the railroad gate, which is some distance from the main gate. And you can see here the Germans are putting up their hands and they're surrendering to the 45th. So Sparks thinks that he's the first one to Dachau. Linden thinks he's the first one to Dachau. And this creates a, a, a tremendous controversy. When they get there, there's like 20,000 uh, survivors who are still in the camp. And they're very happy. They don't care who shows up just as long as, as somebody did. And uh, so they were very, very happy to, to see the Americans there. Uh, and they get a little further into the camp. And this is the gate to the prisoner compound. Um, and Sparks and, and Lyndon get there just about the same time. And they have this brouhaha. Uh, we see Lyndon here. He's talking to some of the other officers and some of the German uh, officers. And, and with Linden's party is this female uh, war correspondent named Marguerite Higgins. And she's there and, and she sees all these people behind the gate, you know, clamoring, you know, let us out, give us food, you know, we need medical attention. And so she goes over and she starts to open the gate. Well, you know, this is going to create a, a rush, 20,000 people, you know, bursting through this gate, probably trampling everybody who's out there. Uh, Spark says, no, don't do that. Get away from the gate. And he starts firing his pistol, you know, and she kind of backs off. And, and Lyndon is saying, you know, she's with our group. She's a correspondent assigned to us. Uh, let her do whatever she wants. And Spark says, no, no, uh, you know, I'm in charge here. And Lyndon says, no, I'm the general. You're just the lieutenant colonel. And so they have this big fight. Uh, Lyndon, um, uh, Sparks tells one of his men to escort the general and his party from this gate area. 
and Lyndon takes his riding crop and hits one of Sparks' men over the head with it, and Sparks is about ready to shoot the general. I mean, it's just a, 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 an amazing situation that's going on. This is the, the gate that they were fighting over, the Arbeit macht frei slogan uh, welded to the gate, uh, the prisoners inside in horrible, ragged, starving condition. Uh, and, and so, you know, this, this becomes a, a, a well, he was, he was a lieutenant colonel uh, by this time. I don't have any shots of him in lieutenant colonel uh, uniform. Uh, but eventually, uh, they settle the thing down. Uh, Seventh Army says that uh, Sparks' men will take charge of the exterior of the camp and Lyndon's men will take charge of the interior. And so they, uh, they go in there and they, they see the, the horrible conditions and the stacks of bodies. Uh, some of the prisoners go a little wild. Now that they're liberated, they, they take out their revenge on the guards. Uh, here's a, a prisoner with a shovel who's just beaten a guard who's lying on the ground. Uh, here we see some guards who were shot at the base of one of the uh, guard towers. Uh, here's a guard being hauled out of the canal that runs along the perimeter of the camp. Um, and here we see uh, somebody with a Red Cross flag, a prisoner, an American soldier with uh, his weapon. Uh, so eventually things get, get settled down and uh, the help, <coughs> help arrives for the, the prisoners. Uh, the, the soldiers give out candy and gum and food and cigarettes uh, and the, 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 the prisoners are very grateful for that. But the, the troops, because they had no idea what they were going to find there, didn't know anything about concentration camps, are in a state of shock. And, and uh, many of them are overcome with, with grief at, at what they had just experienced. Um, the next day, Munich is, is captured by the 45th and some other uh, American units. And uh, the 157th sets up their command post in the Burgerbrau Keller, which is where Hitler began his, his uh, c political career. Uh, and so it's kind of fitting that they, uh, they got to, to do that. And uh, on the 8th of May, uh, Germany surrendered, uh, and uh, General Patton had said in praise of the 45th, uh, 45th Division is one of, if not the best division in the U.S. Army. So that's, that's high praise from a very well-known officer. What did they accomplish? Um, they were in combat for 511 days. They made four amphibious landings in the Mediterranean. Eight medals of honor were awarded to Thunderbirds. They had 4,000 men killed and over 14,000 wounded. So that's over 100% casualty rate. So they were continually getting replacements in. And also men who were wounded but still capable of fighting were returned to service uh, and to combat. I, one of the people I interviewed for my book said he had been wounded six times. Uh, and five of those times he was returned to combat. The, the last time he wasn't. Uh, the troops came home on the troop ships. Uh, it was a very happy homecoming to uh, finally get back to America. Uh, and I think we, we owe a, a debt of gratitude to the men of, of the 45th and of the 157th who uh, took everything the Germans could throw at them and uh, would not be moved. Uh, I'm very hopeful. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but as I said, eight uh, members of the division received the Medal of Honor. I was able to interview three of them for my book, Ernest Childers. And all of them were Native Americans, too, that I, that I interviewed who, who won the Medal of Honor. Jack Montgomery and Van Barfoot. And Sparks later became a Brigadier General, a lawyer in civilian life, director of the Colorado State Water Conservation Board, a Colorado Supreme Court Justice, and ground commander for the Colorado National Guard. He died in 2007 at age 90, and I had spent many hours with him interviewing him and getting his story down for my book. Uh, without his help, 
the story of what happened at the liberation of Dachau probably would still not be told. Uh, a, a counter book came out with the son of Henning Linden. Uh, he wrote that uh, kind of explaining the 42nd Division's side of the story. And uh, so we have competing books uh, about the, the same incident. Um, in the Denver Post a few years back, they had uh, a big feature article on the 157th from Gibraltar to Munich, they called it. And it shows them coming through the Strait of Gibraltar to Oran, the Sicily fighting, Salerno, Anzio, southern France, and into Dachau and Munich. Uh, so they have quite a, a combat record. Uh, unfortunately, today they are almost all forgotten except by people who are in the National Guard uh, and the 157th still exists in the Colorado National Guard. And I'm hoping as our museum moves forward here that we'll be able to find a place to commemorate the men of the Thunderbirds and the 157th who did so much to help win the war for the Allies. So I thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. I have a little microphone here I'd ask that you go ahead and use it, but please, any questions? I don't have a question, but I'd like to compliment our speaker. That's one of the best presentations we've ever had. Oh, well, thank you so much, thank sir. You, yes. I appreciate that. Well, well, I had one question. Mm -hmm. I thought it was my understanding that uh, when Mark Clark raced up to capture Rome, it created essentially a gap where Kesslering was able to evacuate mm -hmm. most of his forces. And wasn't he severely uh, criticized for that? Mark Clark got a lot of criticism, uh, uh, not only uh, for, for that, where the uh, Germans were allowed, as they did in, in Sicily, to basically escape destruction, uh, but he was also heavily criticized by the 36th Infantry Division, which is the Texas National Guard, because he had sent them across the Rapido River where they were uh, torn to shreds. Um, and uh, there was even a, a bill introduced in the Texas legislature to have Mark Clark investigated and uh, you know, perhaps have charges brought against him, but that, that never went anywhere. But there was a lot of criticism of Clark. He was viewed as being a very vainglorious uh, individual who always had to have his name attached to any success that Fifth Army uh, had and uh, uh, always had to have his picture taken with the left side of his face because he thought that was his better side. Uh, uh, and, and so there was, a, there was a lot of anger towards him from uh, the men of the Fifth Army. Yep, yep. Was the 42nd, when they came back, were they programmed at all to be reorganized and sent to Pacific? Because many units division? were. Yeah, yeah, the 45th. Um, yeah, I think they were uh, on orders or at least alerted that they would probably be used in the invasion of Japan. Uh, but fortunately, the Pacific War ended before they were required to, to do that. Anything else? I have Any. one, one thing. Uh, I did bring a few books. I think I have five of them here, copies of the Rock of Anzio. Uh, if you would like one of these, um, and I think they will go for $20 on them, uh, make it an easy round number. So see me afterwards yeah. uh, if you'd and like. And the author that. will sign it. And, and yeah. so will Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. But thank well, you again. Thank Appreciate you. Your being and here Flint, today. thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Mike. And we have one of our challenge coins. Great. Uh, I would like you to have. Appreciate so that. So please, everyone, stick around. Talk with you know Flint some more. And.